So, morning. Morning, everybody, and, and welcome. And it's great to see so, so many of you here for what I think promises to be a really exciting day of, of presentations and, and discussions. So that those of you that were able to join us yesterday heard um, lots about uh, Janet's contribution to, to the discipline, to, to the work of LSTM. Um, but today is about the science. And I think that's still where, where Janet's passion remains. Um, she has, uh, many of us I think have asked Janet, what, do you, what are your plans? What are you gonna do um, come January when your diary's not full of endless meetings? And she's rather cryptically said, the fun stuff. So I hope, Janet, that today captures some of that fun stuff. And as we um, talk about the, the role that, that vector control is, is, has played and is playing towards disease elimination and that, and that you enjoy the, the presentations today. Um, but before we get started with the, the presentations, there are um, a, a couple of people that I want to, to welcome up to make a special uh, announcement. First of all, um, Tamar Ghosh, who's the um, CEO of the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, has got a, an announcement to make. So, Tamar. Good morning. Thank you to the Liverpool School for inviting me to be part of Janet's celebrations yesterday and today. It's been fabulous. And thank you for giving me a minute to make this special announcement. Um, there are many early links between the, London, the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine and the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. In the early days, we were founded just nine years apart, 1898 and 1907, respectively. And Sir Patrick Manson was our first link, so our first president and the first recipient of the Mary Kingsley Medal. Since then, in the decades that have followed, presidents, vice presidents, council members, local secretaries, committee members, medal winners, for us, have come from the Liverpool School. And ongoing, we try to showcase the incredible research that's delivered from the school through our meetings and events, through our scientific journals, and funded through our small grants and travel scholarships. Most recently, the link has been very important to me. Uh, we were asked to host the European Congress on Tropical Medicine next year, and Janet was the first person I called to ask about whether this was a good idea for the society. Not only did she agree, but she gave her support personally to us getting this idea off the ground and is now part of the strategic committee. <laughs> Alongside the historical and ongoing links that we have, we wanted to formalize the partnership between these two important organizations. And now seems the perfect time with so much happening between us and to celebrate the incredible achievements of Janet in the world of translational science. So I'm here to make an important announcement. I'm delighted to announce the Hemingway Awards. This will be a joint award with a cash prize pre presented annually to recognize contributions to translational science for early career researchers and professionals from anywhere across the world. Representatives of both of the organizations will be part of assessing the entries and we hope to open it next year, 2019. On behalf of the board and the team at RSTMH, I'd like to congratulate Janet on all of her achievements so far to welcome our time in working with Professor David Lalu and his whole team at the Liverpool School as we move forward with a new partnership. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tamar. And I'd now like to welcome David Brandon Bennett, who is going to say a few words on behalf of the Gates Foundation. Thank you, Hillary, uh, for allowing me a few minutes to read some words from Trevor Mundell, the president of Global Health at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He wrote, on behalf of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, I want to offer Jan Dr. Janet Hemingway sincere congratulations on a remarkable career. You are an inspiration and model to many in public health, combining amaz amazing administrative achievements with world-class scientific work. I'm sure there will be much said about your contributions to the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine and its central position in making the entire planet a healthier place. In just a few lines, it is hard to summarize the importance of your leadership to the Gates Foundation. You have been a valued advisor and participant in our efforts against neglected tropical diseases, 
especially leishmaniasis in India, and malaria. It was largely through your efforts that the visceral leishmaniasis elimination program in Bihar, India, turned the corner to its current success. You recognize the importance of the challenges posed by insecticide resistance of the sandfly vector and the need for careful data collection. Our NTD program has benefited from your comprehensive analysis of how vector control should fit into our strategy at the foundation. Your championing of the need for a systematic effort to develop new products to overcome insecticide resistance, especially in the fight against malaria, was transformational. Your prescience started the Innovative Vector Control Consortium, a platform that has effectively worked with industry to develop entirely new products that provide the means for insecticide resistance management. Under your leadership, IVCC got off to a strong start on the proce long process of finding and developing new active ingredients and innovative products. We are now in a much better position to address resistance with multiple products that can be used where resistance threatens our ability to control malaria. There are not many people who can look back on their career and see such tremendous impact. Thank you for your contribution to our shared vision of a world where every person has the chance to live a healthy, productive life. I would like to add a few words of my own thoughts to those of Dr. Uh, Mundell. I have had the opportunity to work with Janet and many others at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine for the past 15 years. Th these experiences have been extremely rewarding and enjoyable. I know that the school and the wider global health community will sorely miss Janet, but thanks to her, edu her, her dedication and enormous contribution, she leaves us on a very solid footing to address the challenges we face and achieve our most ambitious goals. Janet, thank you for all you have done for me personally, for all of us in global health, and for the world at large, especially those most marginalized affected and affected by tropical diseases. Thank you. So, thank you very much. And I think we'll now invite uh, Steve Tor and the panel for the first session on um, neglected tropical diseases. Uh, yesterday we heard um, a little bit about the work that Janet did on Onco, the very early part of her career, and um, I, su I suppose the attention is mainly on mosquitoes, malaria, insecticide resistance, but the school has had also a long history, and its associates a long history of working on neglected tropical diseases. And as I say, uh, Janet worked on Onco in an earlier part, and more recently she's been working on uh, Leishmaniasis. So it's a, it's a slightly different opening session, and uh, so first of all, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Herbie Hollingsworth from the University of Oxford, who will give an overview of, um, of NTDs and the, both their impact and framework, and then you'll be hearing from each of the other speakers about particular vector-borne diseases. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve, and it's a really great pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you to Hillary and others for picking my title. I'm not going to promise to answer all the questions, but I'm going to show that they need to be addressed, I think, is the main purpose of my talk. So I'm just going to start, though, um, this one? Yeah. with a uh, thank you to Janet and to LSTM. So I had a suitably intimidating interview for my first academic position, which included Janet. Um, which was a joint position between the University of Warwick and the Liverpool School. So I had a 20% appointment here for a few years. And it was really transformative for me, and I really am very grateful to all of my friends that I see here yesterday and today. Um, as a mathematical modeler, you're really a bit of a parasite yourself because you need the information, not just data, but those real collaborations. 
And at LSTM, I really found them, and they were very successful to transformative scientific collaborations on vector-borne disease, which is what we're going to hear mainly about in this first session, but also parasitology and diagnostics, and delivering interventions on the ground. And that was really been transformative and been sustained since then. Um, I also got invaluable mentorship in developing my first multi-group proposal, my first Gates grant, um, and that mentorship was not just from the academics, which was fantastic, but throughout the entire administrative system. So I know many of them are not here today, but they were here yesterday, and I got a chance to say thank you to them. And so thank you, LSTM, for memorable times and lasting friendships. And uh, as we saw yesterday, those are maintained over many years. So thank you, Janet, for that opportunity of having that post. <coughs> so Steve asked me to say a few words about what NTDs are. So NTDs, neglected tropical diseases, are a group of diseases that were brought together mainly for advocacy reasons, and many of the leaders of that group who identified that need were here at Liverpool School. They have a large burden of chronic morbidity and some mortality. They predominantly affect the poorest populations, often called the bottom billion. And recently, and this is a real success, they've been included and mentioned in the new sustainable development goals. And that's really a recognition that if you can deal with these diseases in these poorest populations, you're really having an effect on their health and well-being because you're actually reaching them with health services. In uh, 2012, the WHO published a roadmap for neglected tropical diseases, which really laid out the pathway to achieving huge gains in terms of the morbidity associated with these diseases by 2020. And they talk about elimination as a public health problem. And what that means, for those of you who are not used to working in NTDs, is that you get transmission down to a low level and that you're dealing with the morbidity associated with infections. But the next question for NTDs is what to do next. Are these diseases going to be targeted for elimination and then in the longer term even eradication? So of course elimination is a very attractive prospect. You have long-term benefits to these populations. So if you eliminate disease and you do a cost-benefit analysis, you have infinite benefits into the future with limited costs now. So depending on what time scale you take, it becomes incredibly cost-effective to eliminate. But of course, there are huge costs associated with an elimination program in the short term. And that's because it's actually very challenging to do. So as we've learned from guinea worm, for example, not only is it challenging to reach these last populations, but also there are some prizes along the way. So the classic in guinea worm was they discovered there was a life cycle, part of the life cycle in Chad involved dogs. And this is an example with, of a dog with guinea worm. And the, these kind of heterogeneities or these details about the local epidemiology often only become visible when you've dealt with the transmission in the groups that you know about. And so one of the challenges for us all, and not just for our mathematical models, are these unknown things that we don't know about that are going to come along. And even if we think we can get there and we're going to get down to a low level, how do we measure zero? You know, you need a huge population size if you want to be sure you're at zero. So you can try and mitigate that maybe by doing multiple surveys over time and, and showing that it's not rebounding. But is it really a good use of money to do a very expensive survey in these poor populations to establish that you've eliminated? Um, so there are, as you can see, there's complex arguments on both sides, and I don't envy the people who have to make these decisions over the next couple of years. But we, as mathematical modelers, feel that we have something to contribute to this discussion. We try and do really phenomenological modeling mainly to quantify the potential impact of these known unknowns and highlight some of the uncertainties and sort of contribute to the quantitative calculations on both sides and try and help those decision makers, as I say, who have a difficult few years ahead. So when I say mathematical modelers, I'm mainly talking about the work of this consortium which I lead, which is called the NTD, Neglected Tropical Disease Modeling Consortium, which was my first large grant which I wrote when I was here at the Liverpool School. We have multiple modeling groups per disease, and we work on seven neglected tropical diseases. We have multiple modeling groups, and we have multiple diseases in our consortium, and we believe that that strengthens our scientific insights. There's always a risk of groupthink and model convergence in these situations, um, but with NTDs, there's enough uncertainty about the epidemiology that actually multiple models is helping us try and investigate all those different possibilities. 
And I'm going to highlight in my talk outputs, two sets of recent outputs. So in June of this year, we published a special collection in Clinical Infectious Diseases, trying to summarize all the work that we and others had done around the 2020 goals. And it's supposed to be for non-technical readers, so do please let me know <laughs> if that's successful. And then uh, we're just in the process of releasing papers um, well, we've tried to look at model-based guidance for data collection. So what do the models say about current m and &E? How might that be changed? By m and &E, I mean monitoring and evaluation. And also, what are the, you know, some of the key epidemiological uncertainties? What can we estimate from the data that we have? And what more data is needed? So I'm going to give a biased selection of the literature. It's not exhaustive. It is mainly pulled from these to promote them. But within them, they do have extensive references that we're not the only people doing modeling in these areas. So there's two types of interventions, mainly, in uh, neglected tropical diseases. And what is surprising is that neither of them are vector control, when a lot of these diseases are vector control. Almost all these vector-borne diseases do mention vector control uh, and do have it as part of their strategy, but it's often not the main uh, thrust, which is, again, something that Janet and others have led the uh, drive to make sure that it's very much part of these programs. But the two main strategies are mass drug administration and intensified disease management. Mass drug administration occurs when you have a very safe drug with a very good safety profile that you can deliver to large parts of the population, usually on a yearly or a maybe twice yearly basis. And it normally happens because actually diagnosing cases is very expensive and it's much cheaper to deliver these drugs. Um, and as we move towards elimination, um, we're inevitably going to be giving more and more drugs to people who are not infected. So in this situation here on this graph, you can see there's a baseline level of infection in the community. You treat people, the level of infection reduces, it rebounds, you treat again, and you treat again, and you treat again. So a successful mass drug administration program treats more and more people who are not infected because it's successful. And then the question becomes, can you actually do that for long enough and well enough to eliminate transmission. And then in this diagram, I've tried, I've tried to highlight some of the issues which might undermine the success of a program like that. So you might be treating the wrong people. So for example, in soil transmitted helmets or schistosomiasis, there's a debate around their school-based deworming programs. Should they also be treating adults? Should they be treating more frequently? Um, resistance, obviously, if the pathogen develops resistance because you're giving out mass drug administration, that could undermine your program. And one of the issues with uh, the helmets particularly is that we don't have markers for resistance, and so it's really phenomenological surveillance. Um, if we have a fast epidemic growth rate, so the surveillance programs for neglected tropical diseases are not as intensive as for other diseases. And we know that there is vast spatial heterogeneity. And so when we're imposing a, well, imposing delivery, <laughs> it's a very positive thing, uh, delivering a program to um, a district, we're off, it's often uh, administered in a uniform way across that district to try and maximize the impact of that program. But actually, we know that some areas of that district may have faster epidemic growth rates or slower epidemic growth rates. And the question moving forward is whether the, those strategies should become more nuanced, and what does that mean for the program to have to try and do that? Importation. This is an, if we're talking about elimination, we really need to think about imported cases. In this diagram, I've, I've highlighted people, but it could obviously be um, vectors. And um, we really, we know more and more about people movement. There are many good studies looking at people movement, but we don't really fully understand the likelihood of a single infected individual causing an outbreak in a particular area. And then systematic non-adherence or systematic non-compliance or systematic non-access. So that in almost all the diseases we work on, there's always a group of people who are not able to access or unwilling to access the treatments, and they can really maintain transmission long term. It's important to say that appropriate effective vector control can reduce all of these risks in the short and long term, and that's not intervening in the human population and so has some ethical benefits. So um, I'm hoping the talks later today will show just the, the potential of vector control in some of these areas. So first of all, how do you get the right strategy? Well, for us as modelers, we, in this collection particularly, we're trying to highlight the fact that you need to collect the right data to do the right strategy. So this paper on the left um, by Edwin, Michael really led, showing that better data gives you better predictions from the models. Um, and then on the top right, this is a paper by Jaspreet Tor and colleagues, the Shisto groups, 
showing that depending, the different colours are the adult burden of schistosomiasis. So sometimes in some populations, the adults can have very high burdens of schistosomiasis, but this isn't detected by the monitoring and evaluation programme. And it can make a huge difference to the coverage you should be treating the adult population. So that particularly on the right, but furthest right graph, depending on the burden in the adults, which is the three colours, that's the coverage you should be getting in your mass drug administration in the adults. But they're not measuring the adults standardly in schistosomiasis programmes. So this could really have a big impact. So the monitoring and evaluation can't address all the unknown unknowns, but we know some of these issues are around. And then uh, Travis Porco and colleagues um, have been studying whether, you know, whether children are really a driving force for transmission, to the extent to which children are driving force for trachoma. We know they are the, a big driving force, but how big are they? And trying to evaluate that from available data. I mentioned spatial heterogeneities earlier. Spatial heterogeneities, um, it's a bit like the coastline of the UK, which gets long, longer the closer you look at it. Um, they occur at all scales. They occur at the individual scale, the household scale, the village scale, the district scale. And clearly, an entity program is not going to go around identifying every single heterogeneity at all those different levels. Um, but it does need to, I think, reevaluate some of this heterogeneity when it's designing the programs, particularly thinking about elimination. And uh, this is some work that we did with Lisa. Well, um, she did um, studies where she did nightly biting, antigen, and MF counts for lymphatic filariasis in the same villages, and all three were telling different stories about heterogeneity. So one of the challenges is, even if we know those heterogeneities exist, we don't fully understand which one me to measure, because we know that we know that different biting rates drive transmission. We know that there are perhaps core groups who are bitten more often, but we don't really know what the right measure is to identify them, yet alone the, the most practical measure to identify those individuals who are most at risk. Um, interventions inevitably ex exacerbate heterogeneity. So if we had heterogeneity in this room where some people were bitten more than others and we reduced um, the level of vector biting in this room, these, the people who are bitten more would be more extremely different from the people who are bitten less as a consequence of that intervention. Uh, and that might be fine if the level of vector biting was down low enough such that these people weren't able to maintain transmission. Um, but those heterogeneities do matter as you reduce transmission. And more importantly, if interventions are applied differently in different places or differently for different individuals, then we know that that will exacerbate these heterogeneities even more. But if the overall level is low enough, then you might be all right. And so there's been um, the Erasmus group for many years have thought about uh, systematic non-adherence uh, to mass drug administrations. But the only, there's only a few data sets by which we understand um, which individuals are more or less likely to access interventions. And so that's an area which I know many people here are looking more into. So I mentioned that there are two main control strategies for neglected tropical diseases, mass drug administration, and the other is called intensified disease management, which is based around better case detection and management and then uh, different responses to that depending on the disease. So this is a massive simplification. But if we think about the, the picture on the right, um, is a schematic of how someone's infectiousness uh, increases over time. This is driven mainly by our vague understanding of visceral leishmaniasis in the Indian subcontinent. So it's a schematic, simplified schematic. But over time, we know that there's an incubation period where people are probably infectious. We don't know how infectious they are. And then there may be some delay when they, from when they show symptoms till they actually get diagnosed, during which they may be transmitting. And then from diagnosis, depending on how effective the healthcare system is, they may stop transmitting or they may continue to transmit. Now, there are many ways in which we can move the point of diagnosis back towards the left and decrease these people's transmission. The first is just strengthening health systems and trying to get people diagnosed earlier. And, and the second is really diagnostics. If we can get diagnostics which can identify the people who are likely to need treatment earlier, then we can start to cut off more and more of this infectiousness. And again, at the Liverpool School, there's many people working in these areas uh, for many different diseases. And there's really revolutionary diagnostics are a possibility to transform the control of these diseases and actually stop onward transmission. But the big uncertainty is, of course, this pool of asymptomatics. We, for most of these diseases, we don't fully understand who is an asymptomatic transmitter. 
and we don't know, so therefore we don't know the proportion of these people, we don't know the life course of their disease, and we don't know if they're therefore a big pool of people who are transmitting at a low rate and perhaps sustaining transmission. And uh, it's a big challenge to these programs where their, um, their main monitoring and evaluation strategy is the number of cases. And we don't fully understand, as we push down the number of cases, um, how much sustained transmission there is among these asymptomatics. And that's a real challenge um, for many, which I know many people in this room are thinking about. And you know, you don't need modelers to tell you that. The modelers can try and help you identify how big that pool might be, or how big it would be if certain things were true. Um, and again, vector control, overall uh, interventions to tran reduce transmission generally will help solve this problem. So talking a bit more about the spatial scale of surveillance, um, this is again a schematic on the left. If we think about how much effort we're willing to put into a surveillance program, um, uh, as we get more and more effort, our probability of detecting cases increases, the red line, okay? But the cost of our surveys is increasing as well, okay? So obviously we're gonna have to try and find some kind of sweet spot because, and in that calculation, we need to think about this, the cost of our response. So as we move to the right, the size of the outbreak when we detect it falls, and therefore the cost of our response also falls. So this is all very nice, nice schematic, but we really don't understand the characteristics of these curves. We believe there's probably a sweet spot where you're doing enough surveillance to catch small outbreaks, but we really don't have the data yet to back up um, those calculations. And so two groups in the modeling consortium have been looking at vis visceral leash analysis and the spatial scale of transmission to try and help those calculations. I'm aware that I'm running out of time, so I'll wrap up very shortly. Um, as I talked a bit more about this earlier, so the role of asymptomatics is really a big unknown for a number of these diseases. And uh, even though the diagnostics are getting better, we still don't necessarily what that, know what that means in terms of transmission. So elimination or control. As I said, fortunately, I don't have to make this decision, so that's good. Uh, <laughs> but we have to try and help the community make those choices. Modeling and other results suggest that current strategies will lead to elimination in some areas. So some people may use then the argument to say, well, we're getting in the right direction. These communities should be getting richer and, and have better quality housing in the future. So if we just maintain control, then that maybe we're gonna reach our goals without the huge cost of an elimination strategy. Um, that has risks because of course, um, you don't know whether the very populations you most want to help will be most neglected in as maybe there's political fatigue or even fatigue of the people who are receiving these interventions. But it is quite a strong argument in terms of the costs of the program. Vector control, we know, reduces the risk of resurgence and the probability of elimination. So although it has all the challenges of resistance that um, Janet and others have studied, uh, we know that it is potentially a long-term intervention without, which doesn't in, intervene in the human population and has a lot of um, positive potential um, but we have to re be realistic about going for true elimination. It will require longer-term efforts and longer-term surveillance and responsive strategies. Um, and therefore, we do need better evaluation, better monitoring and evaluation. Uh, we know that there's a group of high-risk individuals who do not access the NTD programs. And I know that uh, there are several people here researching how to reach those people and how to know where they are and try and help them access this healthcare. And inevitably, a quest for elimination will reveal the edges of our knowledge as it did for guinea worm. And that's fascinating for us as scientists, but will be a challenge to the program. So modeling, I would argue, has a role to play in um, evaluating this decision. It's important to realize that the models are least well validated at low transmission. So NTDs has limited number of epidemiological studies. And unsurprisingly, people didn't do those epidemiological studies where there was very little of the disease around. So modeling has to try and be aware of the limitations of its knowledge and be used to investigate uncertainty. And that's why the parallel efforts in our consortium have helped us to try and think about those variabilities and hopefully try and give some insight. But uh, if we didn't know about those dogs, we would never have been able to predict what's been happening with guinea worms. So don't shoot the modelers for uh, uh, not knowing those kind of things in advance. 
But it's a fascinating area, and uh, I know my colleagues in LSTM, and I know the speakers after us will talk about trying to address some of these challenges. So I'll just finish with a thank you to uh, the huge group of modelers in the consortium, and they're really a fantastic group to work with. Um, and to thank our funders, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and, and the Lee Ka-Shing Foundation, who support my position. And uh, just thank you all for your time. And uh, thank you again to LSTM for some fantastic times and ongoing collaborations. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Deirdre. Um, I think we've got a time for one or two questions. At the end of the session, we'll also perhaps open up the questions to the panel. But if there's any particular questions at the moment for Deirdre. With a lot of the vector control, you don't just hit one of the vector borne mm. diseases, you hit multiple. How do we actually model that into the system and make sure that the people who are making the decisions on control understand that the benefits that they're having across multiple diseases. I think you raise a very important point, of course, and I think integration across diseases, not just in terms of vector control, is something that's very important. And again, I know the NTD community are trying to do things in that area, but I think more could be done. I think, and vector control is, of course, the classic where we tend to only produce the results for one species or one, you know, one vector. And, so often we produce results, we tend to still model single diseases, and we say, oh, there was this reduction due to this intervention. And we try and look, particularly in lymphatic filariasis, we try and look at the impact of malaria programs on lymphatic filariasis. So we're trying to get in it more, but it's definitely unaddressed usually. Thank you. So, so can I now um, invite uh, Dr. Jean-Baptiste Reis from Burkina Faso. So Jean-Baptiste and I have known each other for um, nearly 10 years, uh, Jean-Baptiste was involved in the very early development of Tiny Targets, that was part of his PhD, uh, working with the Rotham Stead, um, several of the people in the, in the room today, and is now involved in large-scale programs uh, which are really contributing to the elimination of sleeping sickness, and uh, Jean-Baptiste will tell us a little bit about that work. Thank you. <laughs> Merci. Thank you, German. I would like first to thank uh, Professor Ranson and Thor for the kind invitation. And if also I'm allowed, I will say congratulations to Professor Hemingway for a fruitful career. It is a pleasure for me as representative of all these different groups and institutions indicated here to show the role of a vector control in the elimination of a African human, human African trypanosomiasis. In fact, this disease also called the sleeping sickness is a parasitic disease that afflicts a rural community in a very, very isolated area of Africa. And this disease is included in the list of neglected tropical disease of the London Declaration for elimination as a public, for problem of public health uh, by 2020. And this disease is caused by trypanosome that has parasite transmitted by insect, that means uh, sets of flight. For a long time, sleeping sickness control was mainly based on key detection and treatment. And uh, you can see here, uh, people that come for blood sampling, and where this blood will apply on the test to see whether they are positive or not in terms of presence of parasite. But despite all this, the disease is still occurring in many animal forces, and the people think that maybe if they are the vector control, that may improve the impact of the activity. Uh, that is why we find the way to add vector control. And at the end of the day, we are expecting the disease to decrease since the contact between the vector and the human will decrease so. In a recent past, vector controls were mainly applied in areas where we are controlling African animal trypanosomiasis, and not for the human cases. And uh, 
scientific community was not really convinced, and you know that even WHO accepted vector control as a strategy just a few years ago. And people think that vector control is not cost effective. And if this is all right, that will be that, that means that there is a real problem for poor people to afford. And so the question of sustainability will be raised here. And uh, for that, we need to develop cost-effective control tools. And that is what we did as a group of consortium working on the development of cost-effective tools. And a tiny target was developed in two models. Uh, the small one for savanna area in, uh, for Central Africa, and the medium one for a degraded forest and mangrove area in uh, West Africa. And this tiny target has been used or been used for control operation. And I'm going to present you two examples using these two types of target and similarity so we'll be able to make a, to see a similarity in the way we are proceeding on field. So I'm going to talk um, about the control uh, within uh, the Mandul focus in Chad and the Bofa focus in uh, Guinea in West Africa. The Mandul focus is located in southern Chad, close to the border with the uh, Central African Republic. And it is an endemic focus where more than 100 cases were counted per, per, per year very, very recently. And there is a swamp within the, the forces. And when people are crossing the swamp, they are likely to be biting the sensitive fly, and we think that this is at the moment the parasite is transmitted to these people. And the Bofa one is one of the most uh, active forces in West Africa, and is, in, is located in the mangrove area, in the coastal area of Guinea. And the most of the population are live in small villages all along the uh, channel of a mangrove, and uh, people move very, very, I don't know what, what to express it. They are likely to move to go for their daily activity in terms of rice cultivation, to cut uh, wood, or to go to for the rice farm. And doing that, they go where uh, sets of flies are occurring and are, are biting at the time. So this is the two forces where we undertook this uh, control. And for the starting, and on both forces, we start for the synthesis by synthesization. We know that it's very, very important for people to know what is the disease, and we need local administration to know what is the disease and how it works. And uh, likewise, we show them the different method of control, so they need to know what is this and what is and why we are deploying target or trap. So they want took them to go to another part. And uh, I think that the most the, the most important thing doing the solicitation is to help people commit to help the technical staff for the target deployment, since it is very very hard work. Technical team cannot only do this by, by themselves, so they need the people to help them in the field. And uh, we do that by direct discussion, and even for local radio broadcasting, and with poster, and we try to organize people in constituting groups for the work on field. After sensitization, we need to map the population to know where they are, and what they are doing, how they work daily, and to be sure that we are not missing the point of contact between people and the vector. And all what is relevant in terms of epidemiology of the disease need to be mapped, so we are going to take great consideration regarding the importance of these places. And uh, for the, the, the mandul, we, we know that it is not a very, very big area, and we see that population is about 40,000 inhabitants in a surface of 840 square kilometers, you know, the density here. And in terms of settlement, you know, it is not big villages, it is some encampment or settlement 
so very, very spread within the, the, the forces. And uh, for the Guinea one in Bofa, it is within the mangrove, you know the channel of the mangrove here, and uh, they have uh, people spread all about the area. And that in Bofa, we consider people living in the mangrove and uh, in the continent, so to make a difference. And after sensitization and mapping the population, we start now the scientific work that means to collect the entomological baseline data and to establish the presence of CC, the density, and the species occurring in the area. And for that, we use, uh, uh, for both uh, mandul and fufa fossils, we use a biconical trap set for two hours, uh, 48, for two days, I mean, 40, 40, 48 hours. And uh, in relevant place, uh, you see, trap here in the swamp, and mainly in uh, places where population and their cattle pass through, because this is a relevant place for contact between the city and, the, and, and population. It is the same case for the, 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 the mangrove, where people go and walk. And uh, the difference between uh, the mandul focused and the bofa one is that in uh, the, the mandul one, we divide the area by two, and this one is considered as the vector control side, and the other one is kept like this, where we only have a, a medical control with no vector control. So in the future, we can easily make the comparison between the incidence within the, the two parts of the, the, fo the fossil. And after we know how is the distribution of the CTC, we now start with a control uh, by deploying tiny target, implementing tiny target. Please don't forget that in, uh, in Chad, this is the smallest one, and in uh, Guinea, it is the medium one. And all around the, in, in Chad, the target is deployed all around the Mandul River, only it's uh, two branches, A and B, and we also made barriers. Since we didn't catch CTC during our anthropological bed data collection on the third one, we make barrier there to prevent or in the case we miss density on this third one. And uh, in uh, both it is on um, all the area. And uh, annually, at the beginning of the year, you replace all the target deployed last year. And in uh, the Mandula, it was about uh, 3,000 target. And in Bofa, it is about uh, 5,000 uh, target deployed annually. And what is the impact of this target on city density? Uh, we can note that in chart, uh, very quickly, uh, target decrease the city density by more than uh, 90%. And, uh, since 2014 up to now, only nine CC flywheel are put, have been put out of the target deployment. That means that uh, the density really decreased at this part. At the opposite in uh, Guinea, it seems a little bit diffi difficult to decrease the density. And you see that uh, on the mainland, the density decrease was about 70%. And in the mangrove itself, that means on the channel, it is only 25%. Percent, and you can see the fluctuation of the density uh, within the time. That means it is not easy uh, if we compare to the, the mandrel cases. And what is the impact of a density, just a density decrease on the disease incidence? And uh, mandrel focus, this has been assessed by means of modeling and using all data from 2000 to 2014, and this is collected from the WHO uh, site. And the case data from 2000 to 2013 were used to fit the model. And uh, we can see, it, 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 to make it easier, please follow the, the blue color and the, the purple one. The blue, Color represent uh, the basic medical control. No, no, the, please, uh, please, please, please uh, follow the, the yellow one. The, the yellow one, the improved medical uh, uh, method. 
if this method was the only one used, one could see that we still have cases in for more than 100, even until 2020. And if you follow the purple one, that improve medical plus vector control, we see that <coughs> even by now, that means in 2018, the case rarely reduces. And we see that up to 70% of the reduction reporting in the area between 2013 and 2015 can be attributed to vector control. So clearly, in the Mandul cases, vector control was a, a positive in terms of impact in the, in the reduction of the disease prevalence and incidence. And then let's go to the Bufa one. As I told you, in Bufa there were a, a area where there was no vector control and the other one with vector control. And uh, we can see the confirmed fact. If we take in 2012 in Bufa West, where there is no vector control. In 2013, where there is no vector control, we have 21 cases. In 2012, it was 18, and in 2013, it was 21. If we want to compare Bofa East, please look at for 2012, before the vector control, we have 24 cases, and one year after the beginning of the vector control, we have only seven cases. So also in, uh, in Guinea, we saw that vector control had an impact on the disease uh, incidence. So what to say? In the two cases, we see that the vector control can participate to the reduction of the disease prevalence. And uh, this method uh, has been used in many, many other forces in different countries, like in Chad, in Cote d'Ivoire, in Uganda, uh, to reduce the prevalence. But we still have some challenge. In Chad, even with the great reduction of the state density for more than 90%, we still have heart cases at phase one. That means that there is still contact between the state of life and the, the people, and we don't know why this still occur. And probably that means that there are sites where we still have CC and where people go in the, the swamp for activity, and we need to, to point out this uh, possibility. Another challenge is that in terms of participation, we know that since the density of city has decreased, people are not willing to get for the monitoring in terms of medical uh, uh, surveillance. And that means that people, positive people, are still remain, and if they are biting, this is a new cases of transmission that can be also noted. The error of the is, is for the Guinea case, I think is more complicated. Since in terms of reduction of density, we still have great height density in, in Guinea. And we don't know how to manage. In the mangrove, since the targets are only deployed within the, the channel, and we don't that inside the mangrove are sites where uh, sets of fly led people. And when once they are emerged, they can come and make revenge with within the, the, the channel. And this is a very, very big problem since we don't know for how long we need to maintain vector control at the site. And these are challenges we need to think about. Mr. President, I think I'm done. And I would like to thank uh, all colleagues and companies that help for the field activity. Thank you, everybody. Thanks very much, Jean-Baptiste. Uh, can I invite some questions? Uh, Thanks, Jean-Baptiste. That was very interesting. I guess it's a question very relevant for this session. Um, with a, a target like that, which is so dependent on insect behavior, and I'm thinking back to cockroach baits particularly, which showed resistance, um, behavioral resistance to the, the sugars in the bait, is there some risk here with this high selection pressure that, that you can select for, for tetsis that don't go for the target so that you're exerting not, not, not a biochemical resistance but a behavioral resistance? Is there any evidence for that and any concerns? What, what to say? Yeah, we, we too are fearing about that because we know 
In particular, when the density will decrease, it may happen behavior resistance, and uh, this is the reality. Uh, personally, I won't say that, but in Guinea, I think that we are thinking that it may happen, and this will be a problem. And, uh, and if this was the case, we may need to change, but by what? Since target, uh, not, not target traps are expensive, if you need, because, because we know if there is a behavior resistant and if you change the way of doing the control, it can be positive, but changing target by traps, I don't think this will be the good direction. But anyway, I think you are right in terms of question. Thank you, Jean-Baptiste, for your presentation. The difference between Chad and Guinea is quite striking. I was wondering whether you are dealing with the same species of uh, tete flies in those uh, two locations. Ah, it is a pity I didn't mention it. It is not the same species. In Chad, it is Glossina fuscupes, fuscupes, and uh, Glossina palpalis gambiensis in, uh, in Guinea. Not the same species. But if we want to compare the swamp, I think it, seem, it is the same thing, but in terms of accessibility, and in terms of size of the area, it is not the same. I, I think this makes the difference. Since it is not, in terms of difficulty to access the swamp and the mangrove, it is the same thing. Thank you very much, Jean Baptiste. Um, I would like now to invite uh, Dr. Lisa Raymond from um, the, the Liverpool School, and she'll talk about uh, research of her group and the the wider LF community on uh, lymphatic paralysis. Thanks, Steve. Now is a very exciting time to be doing NTD research. With the global momentum that we've seen towards the 2020 goals, we've seen increased resources, capacity, infrastructure, and this has all enabled a multidisciplinary approach to research, which is allowing us to tackle a lot of the challenges and the questions surrounding elimination. So I'm going to talk about some of our vector research and how this has informed the elimination strategy for lymphatic filariasis. So the goal is to eliminate LF as a public health problem by 2020, and this is to be achieved primarily through mass drug administration. Now these drugs need to be distributed every five years, at least with a very high coverage. And this is because the drugs only target the juvenile stage of the worm, which is transmitted from humans to mosquitoes. They don't treat the individual who is infected. Now, the scale-up of MDA has been very, very successful, and to date, we've prevented 97 million cases. But with this success comes significant challenges. So as we move from control to elimination, we've changed priorities, and we need new tools and approaches. So during the control phase, it's about scaling up our interventions, increasing access, and measuring transmission, which is relatively easy when you have a disease of a higher prevalence. And a lot of these NTD programs are conducted in disease-specific silos. But as we move towards pre-elimination, the challenge is about identifying those clusters of disease. And those people may be invisible to the program, either because they're asymptomatic or have very low-density infections, or because they aren't presenting themselves when you're distributing interventions such as bed nets or MDA. And at this stage, it's very important to, to get the information that we need on how to scale down, when to scale down our interventions. And then finally, the biggest challenge, when we've succeeded through pre-elimination, -elimin in the elimination phase, it's about validating the absence of disease. And we've already heard how expensive this is going to be to detect zero, particularly for a disease like lymphatic filariasis, where there is very, very little treatment-seeking behavior. Um, at this stage, we also need to be able to detect resurgence, and this is difficult when there's a long um, latency period from the time of first exposure to the presentation of outward signs of the disease. And in this stage, we need to be ready with a rapid response. And the successful programs that we see now, the infrastructure, they, that may not be in place once we've successfully reduced infection uh, below detectable thresholds. So with filariasis elimination, we have multiple rounds of mass drug administration. And then once prevalence of the microfilaria is below 1%, then we move to transmission assessment surveys. And this involves screening school children for the presence of the adult worm antigen. And this is indicative of whether there has been transmission during that child's lifetime, um, at, which is at the same time that these communities should have been under MDA. And if a community or a region fails tasks, then we have to go back and do community-wide mass drug administration again. 
And the metrics that we use for TAS and for these MF prevalence thresholds, they may be the best tool that we have, but they are imperfect. And we've seen more and more evidence, particularly in areas where there's been high transmission or high endemicity previously, where we've met these targets, but elimination has not been stable. So this brings me to the overall research aims within my group. We're conducting research to inform the successful scale-up of interventions, trying to understand what course or what combination of interventions will be the most successful, developing the tools to decide when we can safely lift those interventions, so we need more confidence in what these transmission breakpoints are. And we're also interested in developing approaches to longer-term sensitive surveillance so that we can prevent recurrence. So I'll just give a brief overview to the three general approaches that we use within my group, and then I'm going to present four key findings. The first, um, epidemiological and entomological studies. Most of my work has been in Papua New Guinea and Ghana, and we conduct surveys surrounding interventions such, such as MDA or bed nets to understand um, the transmission, understanding the vector populations and the parasite populations, and various surveys to understand who is and who isn't accessing those interventions. We also use an experimental approach. So we use this both with fields, you know, wild mosquitoes in the field and field isolates to understand vector competence. And here we're interested in how vector competence may shift as our interventions become more successful and as we've brought microfilla area prevalence lower and lower. But we also do lab-based experimental infections so that we can understand more about the behavior and the physiology of infected mosquitoes. And overall, our goal is to understand the vectorial capacity understanding how infected mosquitoes are behaving, and understanding what those transmission breakpoints might be. And the third approach is a theoretical approach. So we work closely with the NTD Modeling Consortium. On one hand, we want to make sure our research can inform the parameters that are used in disease modeling, but we also use these models to help us to predict the longer-term impacts of interventions. So one challenge is that because these interventions are not treating people, they are stopping transmission. And because an individual may be infected for many, many years, it takes a very, very long time studying a community to understand an impact of intervention, say, 10 years ago. So we do use modeling to help us to address some of those questions. And these models include um, you know, in individual dynamics of the worm within the human host as well as within the mosquito host. They include what, what's happening with the vector population. Are they, are they interacting with insecticides in the environment and what is the outcome and what is the efficacy of the drugs that are being distributed. These models also include various community parameters which are important to understand, such as mosquito biting densities and the vector host ratio, understanding the age structure of the exposed um, community members, and understanding the degree of heterogeneity in exposure. We're also interested in correlations um, such as are the most, the highly exposed individuals, are they accessing treatments? And what is the correlation between accessing one treatment this round versus the next round or between two different intervention types? So the first key finding that I'll mention is that transmission breakpoints are species specific. So filariasis transmission is highly inefficient. Uh, the best case we have is proportionality where the number of microfilaria ingested equals the number of infective larvae but um, it's, it's far less efficient than that. And we know that this is genus specific. So in culicine vectors, we have density dependent limitation. So we have a very, very high proportion, a high yield of mature larvae when we have low numbers of microfilaria ingested. But within anophelines, you can see in the green line, that yield is improved as we go to higher and higher densities. So where you have anopheline transmitted filariasis, it's going to be much quicker, much easier to hit that threshold where you have zero transmission. Uh, and this, the, these graphs are based on previous work, pr um, primarily with the Anopheles Gambi complex. But we conducted similar studies in Papua New Guinea where we have multiple members of the same mosquito complex, which is Anopheles punctulatus. And we find very, very different transmission dynamics between morphologically um, identical mosquitoes from the same locality. So for example, the Anopheles punctulatus seen in orange, we can see that this is a very inefficient vector. And um, a slight reduction in the microfilaria in humans, translating to the microfilaria that are ingested, can lead to zero transmission. But we have another species, Anopheles hinosorum, which demonstrates something much closer to proportionality or, or limitation as seen in culicines. And this means that those transmission breakpoints are not just genus-specific, but they are species-specific. 
The second key finding I'd like to mention is that vector control shortens the time to elimination. It would be no surprise to us in the room that vector control will benefit um, a vector-borne disease program. However, this evidence has been very slow to adopt. Now, some of our work in Papua New Guinea, we demonstrated the reductions in biting density observed after bed net distribution. And we also demonstrated the reduction in the, the proportion of infected mosquitoes. So the, these colored graphs show you the proportion of mosquitoes that are infected with any stage larvae, and the hashed bars show you the proportion of those mosquitoes that are carrying infective stage larvae. So notably, we saw a significant reduction in the number of infected mosquitoes out there, but we were unable to find any infective mosquitoes. Of course, one challenge with this is if we're very successful in reducing our vector population, it's difficult to get the sample sizes that we need to have confidence. So we work with various modelers um, to help interpret these findings and help us understand well, what was the actual likelihood of elimination. And during this distribution, we noticed a number of other differences in the community. We saw slight shifts in species composition, shifts in biting behavior, and we also saw a difference in the aggregation pattern. So we saw an increase in heterogeneity as we decreased biting rates. So this graph on the left, the red dots show where these villages sat before the bed net distribution, and the yellow dots show where they sit now. And along the x-axis, you can see that we saw there was a reduction in biting density in all of these communities. And up the y-axis, we also saw an increase in heterogeneity. And the color in the background is the prediction of the number of rounds of mass drug administration that would have been required in that community to reach that threshold. And that threshold is shown by that red dotted line. And as what, what you can see immediately is that three of these villages are completely off the map. The other two would have required 14 or so rounds of mass drug administration, which is very, very, very difficult in a, a country like Papua New Guinea where resources are limited and where access is very difficult. But what you can see is that after the bed net distribution, although we increased heterogeneity, we brought three of these villages very, very close to that threshold, which tells me that we only need a few rounds of MDA, which is much more feasible. And then in the other two communities, we've brought these within reach as well. The third finding I'd like to mention is that mosquito behavior and physiology are impacted by infection. And this is important to understand because we make a lot of assumptions about our mosquito population, but most of our research is done on uninfected and possibly unexposed mosquitoes. But mosquitoes that are infected with, with lymphatic filariasis, this is a very costly infection uh, and we see reductions in longevity. This impacts the lipid and the glycogen reserves in these mosquitoes and this is associated with decreased flight. So these mosquitoes are flying more slowly and they also cover shorter distances. And this is a pattern that we've seen um, at both stages of the infection when they have the, the infected stage larvae living in the thorax and when they have the L3 stage larvae which are typically in the proboscis. Now we've also looked at the host seeking behavior and although we see a reduction in flight at the infected and the infective stage, we see something very different when it comes to host seeking. So mosquitoes that are infected have a significantly lower response to host odors, seen on the left graph. But on the right side, you can see those infective mosquitoes have a significantly stronger response um, to host odors. So we have a real switch in host-seeking behavior from the infected stage to the infective stage. And on one hand, understanding the flight of infected vectors can help us to understand perhaps why this disease is so focal and help us to understand the patterns of spread that we might see following a reintroduction. And the final key finding that I'll mention is that systematic non-adherence influences the impact of interventions and also will influence the best combination of interventions in an area. So on the left side, you can see what happens if we have a very strong correlation. So if, an, if, if the decision that is made this year to access treatments uh, is the same that can be made year on year, even if we have a high coverage, if that correlation is very high, then we need well over 15 years of mass drug administration with the estimated coverage of around 65%. And the, in the green bar, you can see what happens if we add vector control. That's gonna shorten that timeline. But on the right side, you can see what happens if there's no correlation, if it's completely random. Every year we achieve 65% coverage, but it's a random mix of who we're reaching each year. And this, as you can see, brings the estimated time, rounds of MDA down to around five. And in this case, we don't have that much to gain by adding vector control. So we know that it's important to understand what is the coverage that we've achieved with each round of our intervention, but we also need to know what is the degree of systematic non-adherence. 
And we've applied some of these findings in Ghana, where we have communities with persistent disease. So they've, they've seen 12 to 15 rounds of MDA at reportedly high coverage. But the decline in uh, microfilaria prevalence has been slower than what we would expect. And it's still hovering above that threshold. And so in these communities, we find, although there's a high reported coverage, the correlation here is quite high, ranging from 0.65 to 0.8. And that's going to give us a much longer timeline when we're using the same strategy year on year. So on one hand, we're looking at what would be the benefit if we have a very effective vector control as part of this strategy. And we're also working with collaborators who are doing quali more qualitative studies to understand how can this program reach those individuals that we're systematically missing year on year. And looking forward, we're interested in you know, continuing to identify those drivers of persistent transmission in the areas that have had slower than expected decline. We want to identify the barriers to access and adherence so that we can improve the distribution of the, the tools that are currently available. And we're also looking to develop non-invasive and lower cost approaches to community surveillance so that we can confirm the absence of disease and so we can be prepared in the case of a recurrence. And I'd just like to briefly acknowledge the, the primary funders of this work. MRC, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, DFID, and our collaboration with um, Countdown Consortium and the NTD Modeling Consortium. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Lisa. Um, can I invite some questions? Did you? Okay. Uh, yes, we know that um, with patients that are infected with malaria are more attractive to mosquitoes. Seeing you there, your mosquitoes uh, are more attractive to infected people. Is that a, a factor of the people being infected, or is it the mosquito behavior? Okay. So in filariasis research, we do not know whether infected people are more attractive, but we know that infected mosquitoes are more responsive. And they're only more responsive when they have the L3 stage larvae. They're significantly less responsive when they have the developing stage larvae. And this um, is something that has been seen in malaria research, where there's a shift in that behavior, where it seems they're less attracted, attracted and then they become more attracted. But this observation has also been seen to some degree um, in infections of non-vector-borne disease. So part of this may be a generic infection response, which is somehow causing them to be um, less receptive or more lethargic. The flight studies that we did was to address whether perhaps this observation was due to the burden of worms in the flight muscle, which would stop them from, from flying, you know, um, w prevent the, that behavior when they have the infected stage, but the flight behavior didn't fully explain the observation that we see with host seeking. Thanks very much, Lisa. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Dr. Mike Coleman from the Liverpool School, and we'll be talking about the work of his group and partners on uh, visceral release analysis. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to talk. Um, and thanks to Janet for probably putting me here. <laughs> I actually first met Janet 23 years ago as an undergraduate going into her office uh, she just joined Cardiff, and I didn't want to plate out Ager, which is what of all our old professors wanted us to do. And I went up to that lab, and it was wonderful. It was a state-of-art laboratory, as far as we were concerned. And I was introduced at the same time to Hilary, who is um, then a PhD student, who taught me a lot of things, and is now actually my boss. So um, between Janet and Hilary, that brought me all the way back to Liverpool, and Janet continues to influence on my life because I'm actually going to talk about work from where Janet had a conversation with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and their program was having issues back in um, India. And they said, do you know anybody who can help? And Janet said, yes, we can. Um, and then she decided to come back to Liverpool and say, I said, we can help. Off you go. So I'm going to talk about the impact of IRS on visceral release analysis, and I'm going to try and tell you a story about how we got involved and the sort of impact that Janet really has on a lot of the work and how we took what we knew and changed the program. So visceral release analysis, um, for many of us already know this, it's estimated that about 200 million people 
at risk of um, VL, of which 65 million of those live in India, predominantly in the northeast side of it. Over the last five years, we've seen really good progress with the um, increase in better diagnostics and drugs. So we've actually seen a reduction in the number of deaths of VL. Now, India, Nepal, and Bangladesh, they got together to set uh, an elimination target. They want to eliminate the disease from the region. And actually, with good um, background data to this, it should have been achievable. And this is historic data that we've gathered together. But if you go back to the malaria programs in the shaded areas, there's actually IRS that was done for malaria in the very early stages at the beginning, so the first three cohorts. And the impact of controlling malaria or trying to eliminate malaria back then saw a really good impact on fish rhizomniasis to the point in the sort of early um, 1950s where it was very hard to find a sandfly. And if you haven't got the vector, you're not actually going to have the disease. And that was wonderful. And then we have this wonderful pattern of we have resurgence and then more treatment. Now, the last round of IRS that we're seeing here at the very end of this graph is actually where the control programs got together to actually eliminate the disease. But they weren't getting rid of the vector this time. The vector was not disappearing. Disease burden has gone down, which is wonderful, but it sort of stagnated. And the question was really as to why. Now, my whole career has been in Africa up to this point. So in 2013, I went to India for the first time, and the environment's uh, different. And these are the sort of houses that we're working in now. We have a lot of brick houses. Some of them are cemented over, a lot of mud houses. And a lot of these houses are mixed dwellings with cattle in there or cattle-associated areas. So slightly different. Um, but at the same time, we're still dealing with an IRS program, which uh, should be city standard. And the IRS coverage, when we went out there and we were looking at the historic data, was really good. They're working in 31 of the districts with a target of really high coverage and the coverage percentage that was being reported at that time of 97 plus percent, which is, you know, WHO says you should reach 80. So you'd think that if you've got that higher coverage, that you should be having a really high impact on your disease. And so this is the area where we first went to. Um, the sites were chosen because our partner out there, Care India, was already doing work in those areas. And so we basically went and worked in the same areas as them. We had eight sites where we wanted to look at some of the entomological indicators and see what was going on. Now, one of the most basic things we did was to gather all of the previous data that we could that's been published in the literature or gray literature on insecticide resistance. And so we plotted this on a wonderful um, line. Um, and as you can see, oops, sorry, drop this. From 1980 all the way down this straight line, we have a decline in, uh, well, increase in resistance to DDT. And this is data that we collected down this end. Some of this data is a bit tricky to interpret because they weren't following standard WHO diagnostic procedures at this stage. Some people were just exposing for half an hour, some people would choose to expose for two hours. And also, the WHO diagnostic assay, as many people in the room will know, is not actually designed for um, sandflies. It was designed for Anopheles uh, mainly. But it was the best we had. But at the point that we're getting to, we actually show that there is resistance. And so we started looking at what the alternatives might be. And at that stage, high resistance to DDT, but then we have susceptibility to all other classes of insecticide that we could potentially be used for the control program. Now, one of the biggest things we start to look at these days is the strength of that resistance to understand how important it is and whether it's actually really going to have a longer term impact. This is using CDC bottle assays. And the real take home message for this is at a diagnostic concentration um, for the CDC bottle assays, after 45 minutes, what we should be seeing is 100% mortality. If we increase in DDT diagnostic concentration to tenfold after 45 minutes, we still don't even have 
We have about 70% mortality, so it's not working. The alternative insecticide that we were going to be looking at um, for the control program was alpha cyclomethrin. And if we look at that diagnostic concentration, at one time, we're actually getting about 80% mortality. So still not right up in the high standards uh, where we'd like it to be. And we were curious as to why that was. And so work that was carried out by um, other people here in Liverpool, they were looking at the KDR resistance mutation and they were able to show that uh, these sandflies already had KDR resistance in there, which would give rise to DDT resistance, but also some cross-resistance to the pyrethroids. The other mechanisms of resistance haven't been looked at yet, um, and we need to start thinking about how can we actually look at managing resistance with inside this program uh, already. Coming back to the actual program itself, one of the other things we're really curious about is how long these insecticides are lasting on the wall, the efficacy that we always talk about in operational settings. And WHO sort of says it should have 80% residual decay rate. And when we did that for the alpha cyphermethrin, it seems to last quite nicely. But DDT just never got up there. They're spraying it at 1%, and we never saw what we needed to see. And the other thing that we're very curious about, we always want to know, is the quality of IRS. So these um, spray operators are going out into the houses, they were spraying all these programs. And we wanted to know what was the target dose of insecticide they were getting on the wall. Um, the aim was for one gram per meter squared of DDT. For anybody who's worked in the Anopheles area, we normally spray at two grams per meter squared of DDT, or we used to, we don't really use DDT anymore. So we monitored this, setting our target dose at 20% either side of one gram. Uh, we measured it by HPLC. But the essential take-home message from this was that less than 30% of houses received the target dose. Most of them were well below target. So not only do we have an ineffective insecticide going out there, we had less going on the wall than they said, or hoped they were spraying. We took a lot of our own data and other people's data. Uh, we integrated it all together to aggregate um, from RMRI, a research institute that we're working with, from CARE and from Liverpool, to start making some decisions about what it is uh, we could do to go forward. And the major observations, and I don't really want to get into all of the observations we made, and there was many meetings about this, was that IRS coverage <laughs> Um, was actually lower than they'd been saying. There was about 60 to 7% refusal as a main factor. DDT leaves wonderful white dots on the wall or um, streets in the way they were spraying because the uniformity of that insecticide was not nice and even. And there was systematic underdosing of the IRS. Uh, and obviously, we, as you've seen, insecticide resistance actually ranged from 28 to 40%, which is not good. So we actually managed to see some policy changes um, in India. Now, to move from DDT to alpha cyphermethrin was actually a very big change for the program. It took a lot of persuasion, um, sitting in a lot of meetings with the National Vector-Borne Diseases and also the local programs. But they did do that. Um, and the next thing we managed to get them to do was move from this. Now this is the traditional way that they were spraying, um, and this is a, a stirrup pump. The rest of the world was using compression pumps, and a stirrup pump works with two people, one person with a hose pipe and somebody outside with what looks like a bike pump in a bucket going up and down, up and down. It's quite hard work, and it's not an even distribution. So the Bill and Melinda Gates sponsored, um, well they asked us to procure 7,000 pumps and import them into India, which we did. And so, with the change of an insecticide, with the change of pumps, we then put a team together who went to India um, and trained the control program on how to use their new pumps and how to use their new insecticide and actually spray the, the houses, uh, which was a wonderful um, piece of change. The real question is, what is the impact of all of this? You know, it's a real a lot of effort's gone into changing policy. <coughs> And if we actually just look at the abundance of sandflies, 
So this is a general trend taken from a lot of data sets. DDT was sprayed here. Um, we have non-IRS houses in green and IRS houses actually in the yellow tracing that. And as we start to phase in the pyrethroids, we start to see a better trend where the number of um, sandflies that we're actually measuring in abundance goes down a lot better. So the impact on sandfly abundance has actually improved, uh, which we would hope translates into improved clinical cases, which is where we're now starting to look at. Uh, and we have a lot of help from the local children collecting our sandflies for us. It's a very quick whistle-top store of the work we've been doing in India. I'm happy to talk to anybody in more detail about it, but I do want to acknowledge the Regenda Memorial Research Institute who've been working with since 2013, um, and Care India, and our funders for all of this work, which is Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And on the right-hand side is just a snapshot of some of the people who've been involved. It's a massive team, and I wouldn't get their names on one slide, so if I've missed you off, I do apologize. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mike. Are there any one or two questions? say they do. Yeah, the it's the same as malaria. <coughs> uh, no, I'm going to try to remember. 25, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. It is. So, so the, yeah, so the, obviously with the DDT, it's half that of what they would do in malaria, but with the alpha cyclomethrin, it's exactly the same as you'd normally expect. <laughs> Why? Um, I didn't decide. So the problem is they have to use an insecticide which is um, engine registered for use and they only have um, DDT, pyrethroids. Malathion has been used before in malaria, but they're not using that at the moment. So that was the choice. There is no others. Um, and I know in malaria we now have all these new wonderful chemistries, but as you know, the answer to that is not going to be used in, in, the, in the near future. Thank you. Uh, so our last speaker for this morning's session is uh, uh, Bill Black from Colorado State, and we'll be talking about his work and his group on uh, Edie's Egypti. Thank you. Um, I'd like to begin uh, my talk by apologizing to Janet, um, <laughs> because I'm, I'm not going to be talking about work that I did while I was here on sabbatical, but uh, rest assured that about 90% of my program does involve insecticide resistance with Edie's Egypti. So. I'll carry on with that. Uh, this is going to be a little bit more different. This isn't as applied as uh, some of the talks that you've heard. Um, but I am going to be talking about a, what I think is a very exciting area of Aedes aegypti genetics. And that is that the paradigm we've had for many years is that Anopheles mosquitoes uh, and Culex mosquitoes have chromosomal rearrangements, or in modern jargon, what's known come to be known as structural variation in the genome. Um, and I'm going to be pre presenting today uh, evidence that the, this structural variation also occurs in a very important vector, Aedes aegypti, the main vector of yellow fever, dengue, chikungunya, and Zika viruses. And uh, we'll talk about work that we've been doing in West Africa over the last seven years uh, to document this. Very quickly, the people that have made this possible are the Sherikovs uh, at the University of Vermont, Dave Severson at the University of Notre Dame, Laura Dixon, uh, who's now working for uh, Little Fly Labs in Los Alamos, and uh, my collaborator, Masamba Silla, uh, um, with whom I had a R01 uh, to perform this work. Okay, so our current understanding is that Aedes aegypti uh, Sensulatu exists principally as morphologically distinct subspecies, pictured here. Uh, the first uh, uh, one is the Aedes aegypti aegypti, and this is the neotype for the species, 
and it appears as distinctly pale brown or pale scale on the first abdominal tergites, shown here uh, in the blue box. Uh, Mattingly, in 1957, recognized a subspecies of Aedes aegypti called Aedes aegypti formosus as a form with dark scales uh, on the first abdominal tergite, shown there in the red box. Um, but the first thing that we found when we started working with mosquitoes uh, in West Africa, and specifically in um, Senegal, was that we never found Aedes aegypti with a tan cuticle in Senegal. Uh, so this, this neotype uh, appeared not to be present. The specimen that I'm showing you here uh, is from Rabbi Kenya, and you can see the distinct differences in the body color between those forms. This specimen is Aedes aegypti formosus, also from Rabbi Kenya, and we encountered dark cuticle Aedes aegypti like this in Senegal, but they often had mini scales on the first abdominal tergite. So we mapped the distribution of the mosquitoes uh, in Senegal that had these scales and uh, came up with a very distinct ecological decline in the pattern of scaling so that we looked at about 3,500 uh, mosquitoes and found a decline of mosquitoes that had the scales present in the uh, western part of Senegal and along the coast and then following a decline where uh, scales were absent throughout most of southeastern Senegal. So we um, attempted to cross these um, mosquitoes with and without scales in a whole series of lab experiments, which took uh, quite a long time because these Senegalese mosquitoes don't uh, behave well, uh, don't, they don't mate well, and uh, there, was, there were uh, low fecundity in these. So we looked at insemination rates and assortative mating as possible pre-zygotic barriers um, in, these, in these mosquitoes and found really no evidence for any pre-zygotic barriers in the laboratory. We then attempted to construct F1 intercross families from laboratory strains and the Senegal Aedes aegypti also failed to uh, produce uh, high egg to adult survivorship. And so we tested then for post-zygotic isolation. We made a series of back crosses to test for Haldane's rule, as modified by Presgraves, Presgraves and Orr, four species of mosquitoes, such as Aedes, that have sex-determining locus rather than a sex chromosome. Predictions were that increased sterility uh, would occur in male but not female F1 hybrids. But instead, we observed that a large proportion of the females mated to hybrid males laid no eggs. Egg to pupil survivor was significantly reduced in families in which males had mated to um, hybrid females. As an independent test early on um, for changes in the, in the X chromosome, we also did a series of crosses with a classic marker called white eye, which is, occurs 14 centimorgans away from the sex determining locus on chromosome one. And I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail here, but the predicted recombination rate um, in these crosses was that there would be four, it would be 14 centimorgans, white eye would segregate 14 centimorgans from um, the male determining locus. So uh, instead what we found was that white eye and the sex determining locus co-segregated co at 15, 14 centimorgans in Mexican uh, populations in Mexico families, those representing the Aedes aegypti, aegypti uh, neotype, but they segregated independently in about 16 to 60 percent of the Sen Senegal families. And you can see the map of uh, distribution of the uh, crossing over in Mexico in this slide and then uh, in Senegal. And you can see there is a large proportion of mosquitoes in the Senegal collections for which uh, the white eye locus and the sex determining locus are unlinked. At this time, we got the Sherikovs involved in this, and uh, this paper is already published, so I'm not going to spend much time on this, but we found examples where we had duplications of the ribosomal DNA locus, which is on chromosome one. They also documented uh, extensive series of uh, inversions on chromosome three um, in these strains. 
So at this point, we chose to, uh, partly like everybody else, we were excited about, uh, about high-density libraries and, and, uh, and doing whole genomics, population genomics on these. And so uh, we tried various things and eventually settled on a whole exome capture of these mosquitoes uh, generating TrueSeq libraries. And these were prepared using uh, genomic DNA. DNA was sheared to 300 to 500 base pairs. Exome capture was then performed to enrich for coding sequences using the customized uh, uh, SeekCap EZR developer probes. We, are, we were, for this uh, study, using the uh, Aedes aegypti L1 or L1.1.3, um, but I have repeated these now with the L4, uh, the results that I'm about to present to you. So in total, about 26, about 27 megabase pairs of the genome comprising about 16,000 of the 18,769 genes in the genome were enriched for. These were, um, the unbound DNA was then washed away and libraries were generated. Okay, um, so I'm just a brief introduction to population genetics. I don't want people to get up and fall asleep or become comatose. So um, just quickly, uh, the measure that we're using to document differences in the frequencies of SNPs uh, in these whole genome libraries is a measure of genetic distance called FST. Uh, was developed for SNPs and uh, whole genome sequences by Famagli in a paper in genetics in 2013. It has the property of incorporating both variation in uh, uh, SNP frequencies within populations as well as among populations. It also has the nice property that we can uh, calculate FST for single loci, for single markers, as well as for the entire gene. So it has those two nice properties. What we do then is to calculate this FST over all of the 16,000 SNPs. And just uh, to give you a sort of hypothetical uh, picture of what would happen with this, with this histogram is, we have values of FST that go from zero up to one um, on the x-axis, and on the y-axis we have the, the probability or the density of those values. So if, when FST is very small, uh, this curve, uh, solid black curve represented here, um, this is the type of distribution that we would expect to see. It's a beta distribution. Whereas when uh, markers um, are becoming different or are different in frequency between populations, we end up with uh, the uh, curves on the, on the right there. So to start with, we compared some populations of Aedes aegypti aegypti that we had from Thailand and looked at the beta distribution or the FST distribution of markers along that, uh, uh, among all three po uh, chromosomes in that population. And what you can see is these all overlap for all three chromosomes. And the purple curve on the bottom indicates uh, statistical significance. And you can see there were no spikes in statistical, uh, there were no significant differences beyond the false discovery rate in that population. Compare this with PK10, which is a, a classic Senegalese um, Aedes aegypti. In other words, it had scales on the thorax, but the cuticle was dark, and it had, they had it been used in multiple of our crossing experiments earlier on that I showed you. And you can see that the three chromosomes have very distinctly different um, uh, frequency distri uh, distributions of FST, and that the purple line at the bottom, those are LOD scores, um, are uh, very pronounced in in the uh, Aedes aegypti, what we call the Senegalese Aedes aegypti um, mosquitoes. So the experiment that uh, Laura did is she went over to, uh, once we had established this cline and once we had documented this, these uh, differences in uh, both the linkage maps and uh, uh, the uh, whole genome libraries, is that um, she went over and collected mosquitoes from tires, 
from a few natural containers, but most of the containers that we have listed in this study were just small containers, uh, cans, discarded garbage, that kind of thing, as opposed to uh, large tires. And uh, the first thing you can see is, uh, I should mention that Sinto Malem and uh, Tamakunda are both uh, in the middle of that climb uh, that I showed you earlier. What you can see is that um, we had significantly more mosquitoes with no scales in the tires. Again, this is distinct from what we usually see with Formosus, for example. And a few mosquitoes with scales from the tires. That was in Sinto Malem which is a little bit more of a, a rural area. In Tambacunda, in the town of Tambacunda, we again saw an excess of individuals without scales in the tires. And in the artificial containers, the trend was reversed. So what we did was to build uh, whole genome libraries of these. Now, the way that we read these graphs, it's a little bit complicated, but this is, again, just an FST histogram or a genetic distance histogram. The way we read this is, is, for example, the purple line that you see there. Those are mosquitoes taken in Tambacunda, in a more urban site, from tires. And then what we're doing is we're comparing the frequencies of uh, these markers in mosquitoes without, without scales, in other words, the typical Formosus types, versus those with scales. And what you can see is that the uh, FST curve is strongly skewed, the purple curve is strongly skewed, indicating that there aren't very large genetic distances between the F and the G mosquitoes, the scale versus unscaled mosquitoes in those groups. Whereas, if we look at, at for example, the blue, the symptom of and the tires, um, there appear to be um, some differences, but again, uh, not, not large. And so these scales, uh, that Mattingly de uh, described for differentiating these two species, or subspecies, sorry, um, back in 1957, doesn't really seem to be very predictive of genetic differences between these. On the other hand, when we look at tires versus other artificial containers, they're not very different in symptoma limb among mosquitoes without scales, but if we look at the mosquitoes from Tambacunda, with and without scales, we see very large differences in FST. So the point is that the differences may be more related that we're seeing in the, between these mosquitoes and other mosquitoes we collect other places in Africa may have more to do with the type of containers that they're, uh, they're found in rather than morphological characters. And this is also true if we want to just compare urban versus rural sites, we found that Things in tires uh, appear to be very similar to one another, but mosquitoes collected in artificial containers appear to be distinctly different. So the conclusions are failure to oviposit, low fecundity, and poor egg to adult survivorship occur when Aedes aegypti from Senegal are crossed with Aedes aegypti aegypti laboratory strains and when Senegal collections are intercrossed with one another. So there's a lot of uh, genetic differentiation in West Africa, uh, and we are just beginning to get a handle on this. There are no prezygotic barriers to mating between Senegalese Aedes aegypti and, and uh, Aedes aegypti laboratory strains and pattern of sterility in the sexes are not consistent with Haldane's rule. Chromosome one carries chromosomal rearrangements and larger than average sequence differences. Uh, they also predict, with Resgrave Noor's prediction, that rapid evolution of male-specific genes will occur in species with uh, sex-determining locus on an autosomal chromosome. There's a possibility, and we're st uh, still in the process of trying to look at this, that inseminated females don't recognize accessory glands from Senegal Aedes aegypti. Remember, these mosquitoes were mated, but uh, they didn't seem to, um, they didn't produce any offspring. So we have yet to demonstrate barriers to gene flow between chromosome region arrangements type. It's because it's difficult to get uh, to image these and to get uh, a grasp on what these chromosomes are. But these observations are consistent with reproductive isolation within and among Aedes aegypti in Senegal. And this in no way uh, contradicts earlier work done by Walter Tabachnik, Jeff Powell, and others about these differences. But the point is we don't really have good tools at this point um, to intensively and, and in a detailed way 
characterize these chromosomes. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bill. Uh, I think we've got time for one question or two. Bill, do you find this elsewhere in Africa, or is this peculiar to West Africa? It's, it's peculiar to West Africa. We haven't documented it at all in uh, East Africa. That seems to follow the classic Formosus aegypti paradigm. Um, thank you. Can you give me some kind of indication of what any sort of applied um, conclusions from this work might be. I, I'm not a genet geneticist in any oh. way, shape, or form, so I have no idea what any potential implications for control might be of your findings. Uh, we have done insecticide-resistant studies on these populations, and they're uniformly susceptible still to uh, most pyrethroids. Um, that's about all the applied sort of things that we've done so far with them, but if, if you know, and you said you didn't know, the Anopheles literature, these uh, chromosome types can be uh, very closely associated with vector competence uh, and uh, host preference and those kinds of things. Hi, um, is there time for one more? Um, so chromosomal inversions are fascinating, right? They can have really dramatic effects on phenotypes if you think about some of the classic examples. Do you know how big these inversions are, what's in these inversions, or what other associated phenotypic changes might be? Yes, the chromosome yeah. 3 inversions are actually pericentric inversions, uh, which is strange. Uh, if they've been characterized accurately by the Shurikovs, that's what they appear to be, which is why we were thinking that we'd find uh, strong reproductive barriers. Uh, pericentric versions are, of course, going to induce chromosomal breakage and bridge fragments and things like that. Uh, to date, we have seen some evidence for that, but as, as I said, it's difficult to characterize these chromosomes. Okay, thanks very much, Bill. Okay.